So you're talking with a coworker about the things you're learning about Jesus in the Gospels. And suddenly he or she says to you, you know, my professor at college told us that we shouldn't take the Gospels very seriously because their authors change the words of Jesus. Therefore, they're not really trustworthy. And you're thinking to yourself, really? Do the Gospel authors change the words of Jesus? Well, we're going to discuss that in this video blog. Be right back. Hey, thanks for sticking around. This is askabibleprof.com, where we give straightforward answers to your questions about the Bible and Christianity. And today we're talking about redaction criticism. Now, at times, redaction criticism can be kind of obvious and straightforward. And other times, it could be very subjective and lead to blind speculation. And often that's how modern skeptics and liberal scholars like to use it. They use it so they can promote their biases and prejudices against the Bible and Christianity. So as you're watching this video blog, please keep this in mind. This is a very complex topic. Think of this video blog as Redaction Criticism 101, Baby Steps to Understanding This Important Discipline. So keep that in mind as we continue. So to begin with, it's necessary to set the table for our discussion. And the first important point is this. Jesus' native tongue was first century Aramaic. Now, that's not to say he couldn't speak Greek. Matter of fact, there's ample evidence to suggest that he was bilingual. Nevertheless, his native tongue was first century Aramaic, and that's not like modern Aramaic. Now, some of you might be asking, well, why is that important? It's important because our canonical gospels were written or are written in Koine Greek. And that necessarily means that at times, as they translated Jesus' words from Aramaic to Greek, they had to make interpretive decisions in order that Jesus' teaching would make sense to their immediate audience. And some of you might be asking, well, why is that important? Well, that's important because that's why modern skeptics and liberal scholars like to use redaction criticism in order to challenge Christians with the trustworthiness of the Gospels. And really, that's the burning question in this discussion. Were the gospel writers trustworthy as they documented what Jesus said and meant? Liberal scholars and modern skeptics would say no, they weren't. Conservative evangelical scholars would say yes, they were. And in fact, that's what the gospel authors themselves testified to. In chapter 21 of the Gospel of John, the Apostle John stated that what he wrote was in fact true. And Luke, in his prologue, said this, that he had thoroughly investigated precisely what had happened so that his audience could know precisely what Jesus said, did, and accomplished on their behalf. So the gospel writers claim that they were accurate and clear and precise as to what they documented concerning the life of Jesus. So having set the table for our discussion, now it's important for us to define exactly what we mean by redaction criticism. A recent publication defined redaction criticism in this manner, an approach to the study of the scripture that compares similar documents to detect different emphases by the respective authors in order to assess their distinctive contribution. So that's a pretty good definition. It's awfully broad to discuss the synoptic gospels, so let's look at another one. Redaction criticism concerned itself with the unique theological purposes, views, and emphases that the evangelists have imposed upon the materials available to them. Well, that too is a good definition, but the problem is it's just a little restrictive because it focuses on theological contributions. And the fact of the matter is, some of the gospel writers made edits or redactions just for grammatical and stylistic purposes. There was no really different theology behind them. So those that definition is just a little too restrictive. So with that in mind, I've composed a, a definition on my own. Redaction criticism is the discipline of comparing different literary sources in order to identify editorial changes, i.e. redactions, an author has made to the written sources he depended upon while composing his own gospel. So that's the definition we're going to work with in this video blog. So that should be sufficient for now. The bottom line is this. 
we are looking at editorial changes made by the gospel writers to the written sources they used while they were composing their own gospel. So with that in mind, let's move on. So how is this going to work for those of you who can't read Koine Greek? Well, I have taken a couple of passages from the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, and I have translated them using a word-for-word -word correspondence as best I could from the Greek into the English. And so whenever you see a word in white in any of these passages, as we compare them from the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke, please understand those are the exact same words in both passages, and those words appear in the exact same order, whether they are found in the Gospel of Matthew or the Gospel of Luke. So just keep in mind, any word that is in white is the same regardless of the passage, both in vocabulary and word order. But it's the words that are in yellow that reveal that a redaction or an editorial change has been made. Now, I'm going to suggest that Luke has depended upon Matthew's gospel for, as one of his sources, so please keep that in mind. So, the bottom line is this. All words in white are the exact same, and they are found in the exact same order in both the gospels that we're looking at. Only the words in yellow show an editorial change. And by using this method, then we can all pretty much understand what we mean by editorial changes, whether we're reading it in the English or the Greek. So with that in mind, let's look at the passages. So the first two passages we're going to look at are from the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, and they are both found in chapter 3 respectively. In these passages, we have a quote from John the Baptist as he interacts with the Pharisees. And as I said, the redactions will appear in yellow. So Matthew reads in the following manner, O brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Therefore produce fruit worthy of repentance. Notice the word fruit and worthy in yellow would be both found in Matthew's gospel in the singular. Whereas the gospel of Luke reads in the following manner, O brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Therefore produce the fruits worthy, both are in plural, of repentance. So as you can see, Luke has changed his Matthean source from the singular word for work to plural, which means works. And the word worthy, since it's describing the works, that would also be found in the plural, where it's just found in the singular in Matthew. So one is left to ask, why would Luke make such a redaction to his Matthean source? Well, in order to answer that question, we must identify who John the Baptist was talking to and who were the primary readers of Matthew's Gospel. Well, John was most definitely talking to a group of Jews, and the primary audience for Matthew's Gospel were Jewish readers as well. Well, because of their education in the Old Testament, Jewish people intuitively knew that there wasn't just one work of repentance, but that a repentant heart lived a lifestyle of righteous works. And therefore, they just knew, just because of their Jewish upbringing, that there were multiple works that were demonstrated or evidence of a repentant heart. That's not necessarily true for Luke's audience, who was primarily Gentile or pagan. In other words, if Luke had not changed what Matthew wrote, then his audience may, might have misunderstood that there's a single work that demonstrates a repentant heart. And that's not what John the Baptist meant. And that's not what Matthew meant as he wrote the work of repentance. Therefore, Luke made a redaction. And in doing so, he pre prevented his Gentile readers from misunderstanding a Jewish concept. So in that sense, Luke provided greater clarity as to what John meant and what Matthew wrote concerning the works of repentance. So the next two passages we'll be looking at come from Matthew 11 and Luke chapter 7. Matthew 11 reads as follows, But the least man in the kingdom of the heavens is greater than he, speaking of John the Baptist. Whereas Luke reads in the following manner, But the least man in the kingdom of the God is greater than he, meaning John the Baptist. So just like the other two biblical passages that we looked at, here we have both Matthew and Luke not only documenting the same event, but the exact same dialogue, with the exception of the redaction that we noticed in yellow. So the burning question for this example is, 
Why would Luke change his Mithian source from reading the kingdom of the heavens to the kingdom of the God? Well, in order to understand what's going on in Matthew's gospel, we have to understand Matthew's primary audience, which most scholars recognize was Jewish. In Jesus' immediate audience and to Matthew's readers, the terms the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven are synonymous. They, they virtually mean the same thing. The issue here is that for Jesus' audience and Matthew's readers, Jews were very cautious about throwing around the term or the name for God. A lot of times, just out of reverence and respect, they would refer to the place where God abides rather than use his name. Now, that's not to say that Jesus would never have used the phrase the kingdom of God, because Matthew actually documents in four different occasions Jesus actually referred to the kingdom of God. But generally speaking, Matthew and Jesus would have used the term the kingdom of heaven just out of respect to their audience. Well, what does that mean for Luke's audience, who most scholars recognize comprised largely of Gentiles and pagans? Well, this is a big deal. Because if you have Jesus saying to a pagan audience, the kingdom of the heavens, well, a pagan audience would read that and believe, well, Jesus is affirming the reality or the existence of the Greek pantheon. Because that's where the gods exist. The gods exist in the, in the sky, in the sea. There's the god of lightning, the god of fertility, the god of rain, the god of war, and so forth and so on. So that's a real problem. Because Jesus never would have affirmed that the Greek pantheon was a reality. Jesus knew that there was only one true God who was both the creator of heaven and earth. And that God was also the personal God of Israel. So Jesus would not have affirmed the reality of the Greek pantheon. So in this situation, Luke has protected his pagan and Gentile audience from misunderstanding Jesus and gave them greater precision and accuracy as to what Jesus meant. And again, remember, to Matthew's readers and Jesus' original audience, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven are the same place. They refer to the same place. They are synonyms. So Luke has not changed Jesus' meaning. Luke has not damaged what Jesus said, nor is any, has he invented fiction about what Jesus meant. Instead, he has provided greater accuracy and precision as to what Jesus meant when he talked about the kingdom of God. So what's the bottom line? Well, the bottom line is this. The gospel authors didn't compose fiction about Jesus and insert into his lips teachings he never uttered in order to meet the subjective felt needs of their ancient audiences. Instead, they were trustworthy, as the passages we just studied demonstrate. And in doing so, they provided greater precision, clarity, and accuracy, not only to Jesus' words, but his meanings. And they also documented his ministry, his life, his death, and his glorious resurrection in order to offer eternal life to all those who would receive him. Because that was the immediate, real need of their audiences, to know with certainty and accuracy and precision what Jesus said what Jesus meant, and what he did on their behalf. So with that in mind, I hope you appreciated the video. Hit like if you did, and may the Lord richly bless you and all those you love as you seek to magnify him and increase his glorious kingdom. This is AskABibleProf.com. I'm Dr. Monty Shanks. Thanks for watching, and God bless.